very interesting. Um, last week we talked about tension. Uh, how many of you heard that message last week? The rest of you are backslidden. Okay, we're going to work on that. Uh, and this is a, a, another another message that exemplifies one of the great tensions that we see in in the idea of God. Um, the message today is not about tension, but it, it, it shows us another way that the Bible is constantly, seemingly pulling us in two directions, but we're not really being pulled in two directions. And I, I wanted to t- talk about uh, this idea, and, and I'll get into it here in a moment, specifically when it comes to the life and the story of Jesus, since we're moving into a season where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And um, a couple of, uh, I think back in May, I preached a message called Fully God and Fully Man, if you remember it. And it was this idea that God is both, that Jesus was both fully God, but Jesus was also both fully man. It wasn't like 50-50, right? Uh, that that, that he, he, he came in the form of flesh and was fully man, but he was also fully God. And that the Lord was trying to teach us something about our own humanity through that. And so I'm going to kind of take that and merge it with the Christmas story in a way that has kind of been speaking to both me and Robin and hopefully help all of us in the room um, re- reorganize, if you will, our thought process around the holiday season and uh, our own humanity. And so I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to set this up, and then I want to get more specific with you and kind of drill in on this together. I know that's vague, but we'll get there, I promise. Um, I want to read out of, uh, we'll read out of um, um, Romans 1, 2, and 4. It says this, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, I've heard this talked about and probably even spoke about it myself over the years, about this idea that Jesus became flesh. We say he became flesh and he dwelt among us. But I don't think we really really fully embrace what that means. I don't think we really totally get what that means for one another. And over the years, there was a lot of teaching about this idea of getting us out of our flesh. Anyone ever grow up with that kind of teaching? Nobody? Just me? All right, a couple of you. All right, just don't want to admit it, right? Like we used to have a joke that um, if, if you were dancing in church and your hips were moving faster than your feet, then you were in the flesh. All right? Some of you were in the flesh this morning. I saw it, okay? No, we don't have that rule anymore. Um, but we always used to say, well, you know, she was in her flesh. She was, she was clearly not in the spirit. She was in the flesh. And so anytime anybody did anything or had some sort of like prophetic utterance or something going on, we would all just sit back and decide whether they were in the flesh or the spirit. And it usually depended on whether or not we liked what they had to say, Right? If they said hard times were coming and the church is in trouble, they were in the flesh. If they said there's going to be a miracle offering, they were in the spirit. Do you get what I'm saying here? And so there was this idea around trying to live as spiritually as possible, trying to attain this godly representation and allowing our spirit man to be bigger than uh, the, 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 the fleshly part of us. And although I think there's some stuff rooted in there that is... Um, that it's okay, it's okay to deny our flesh some things that are destructive in our lives. I'm not, I'm not going against that idea. But we got it taken to a point where people became so spiritual and so obsessed with getting it right according to the word that they weren't actually listening to their own human experience. They were denying their human experience in order to fit it into a theology that didn't have the room for their human experience. And I believe wholeheartedly, and I could be wrong, and I don't mind saying that because there's plenty of times I'm wrong. Um, Just ask Aaron and Robin and pretty much anyone in my family. Um, I'm okay with being wrong, but I feel like we can accurately say that the reason that God came in man form 
was he wanted us to know as human beings that our human experience matters. That your human experience matters. That, the, that your experience with other human beings matters. And I'm going to say this to you, and I know I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully support it here well enough that you don't think I'm crazy. I believe that our human experience is equally as spiritual as anything that we read in the Word of God. I know, I know, immediately, like, he's a nut. That's true, but not about this. You have to understand, Jesus became flesh, and in his, in his human form, he endured everything that we could ever endure. We're going to talk about the birth of Jesus here in a moment. But he endured the pain, the suffering, the rejection, the betrayal, the fear, the anxiety, the, 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 the punishment of, of, of authorities bigger than himself. All of the things that we have that are difficult in our lives, he experienced. Why? Because the scriptures wants to put some onus, some, some, some value, place value on the idea of our human experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of uh, where I'm coming from on this. Maybe about six months ago, I was in my office, and I got a phone call from somebody I have a lot of respect for over the years. We have some different theological ideas, but the person wanted to argue with me about some of our, 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 um, our, our theological stances when it comes to human rights. And we got talking through it, and um, I tried to lay down a theological case that they could wrap their brain around it from a different perspective, and that didn't work. So I moved to the human experience part. So, you know, we've, some of the marginalized groups out there that, uh, you know, we, we see the rise in, in the suicides of kids and teenagers rise in groups of people that have been traditionally marginalized by the church, those percentages will hit four and five times the number of groups that are more welcome and accepted in churches. And I said, and 80% of those four or five times numbers will come back and say, you know, through a letter or through text messages or they dive into journals and the pain that they were suffering and the reason they took their own life usually has something to do with them not feeling like they're valued by their creator anymore because of what they heard from pulpits. And I told this person on the phone this, and I said, that blood is on our hands of kids, of teenagers, of young adults who take their own life because they don't believe God loves them because they've been told that. And this person said to me on the phone, it was one of the most cold, chilling moments of my life, I promise you. They said this, they said simply this, they said, well, of course they're trying to commit suicide or taking their own life because they're living in sin. Now, folks, if our human experience is denied to the point that we will somehow justify and make room in our theology to say, oh, well, to kids taking their own life, something is wrong. Because if that's happening and the real human experience, not some, you know, corporate agenda mixed into society, but real human experiences, that kid wrote a letter saying, I'm not going to get to heaven anyways. I, I might as well just end this now. My family has kicked me out. My, my, my church community is, has, uh, uh, you know, uh, abandoned me. And so I just might as well take my life now. And we can read that and go, oh, well, and not feel like we must have to be driven back to our own capacity that our theology is stuffed into and say, hey, we need to find some more room here. Then, then we're forgetting that God is both fully God in the form of Jesus and fully man. We're forgetting that the human experience matters. The human experience matters. When somebody tells you they're in pain, that matters. When somebody tells you they feel like God because of what they've heard from people that are supposed to represent God, that God hates them or God 
you know, sees them as something is wrong with them or God sees them as incomplete or, a, or they're screwed up or whatever it is or they're abnormal or whatever it is. When somebody tells you that, we listen to them. We, we listen to them as much as we listen to Paul, as much as we listen to Peter Wright, as much as we listen to something from the Old Testament, as much as values we place on that, we place it on the human experience too because sometimes the only way that we will begin to change our mind is when a human experience doesn't match with our theological perspective. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I, 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 I Thank you. I will preach. Thank you. Thank you. And the more you say that, the happier I get. Um, you know, um, acknowledging the humanity in something or somebody or yourself does not diminish the divinity. We think that one pulls from the other. Something can both be divine and also we can acknowledge the humanity in it. Why? Because we represent it in Jesus. Think about it this way. The scriptures do not write, that I'm going to get downright heretical right now. The scriptures did not write that Jesus is the hope of glory for the earth. The scriptures wrote that Christ in me is the hope of glory, which means it required divinity wrapped in flesh. Which means this earthly vessel right here, has, come on, has divine value when I embrace and wrap it around him. That, that actually God only does his work here on the earth wrapped in flesh. Now, if that doesn't tell you what you're carrying around with you right now isn't valuable, if this isn't valuable, it should. And this... We're, we are recognizing simply this, that divine influence only works when it's combined with the authenticity of humanity. Will you come and read that for me? I want you to hear this. Now this is a little, a little, some language here is a little graphic when it comes to childbirth. And so if you I think most of the kids are gone, and the ones that are here, it's going to go over their head. So here you go. Okay, so this uh, was written by Caitlin Schepler. Uh, it's titled, Sometimes I Wonder. Sometimes I wonder if Mary breastfed Jesus, if she cried out when he bit her, or if she sobbed when he would not latch. And sometimes I wonder if this is all too vulgar to ask in a church full of men. Without milk stains on their shirts or coconut oil on their breasts, preaching from pulpits off limits to the mother of God. But then I think of feeding Jesus, birthing Jesus, the expulsion of blood and smell of sweat, the salt of a mother's tears onto the soft head of the salt of the earth. Feeling lonely and tired, hungry, annoyed, overwhelmed, loving, and I think of the vulgarity of birth is not honest if the vulgarity of birth is not honestly preached by men who carry power but not burden, who carry privilege but not labor, who carry authority but not submission, then it should not be preached at all because the real scandal of the birth of God lies in the cracked nipples of a 14-year-old and not in the sermons of ministers who say women are too delicate to lead. Now you know why I didn't read it, because I don't agree with it, all right? Just kidding. You know, I'm going to say this, divine things are birthed out of the mess of humanity. Let me tell you, Mary's hair wasn't done when she was holding Jesus minutes after the birth. Her makeup wasn't right. The clothing she wore wasn't unstained. We don't even know if she was clothed. She's 14 with no anesthesia, probably historically as accurate as we can, birthing the baby in the ground floor of relatives' homes where they would keep 
not an inn, relative, probably a relative's home, the bottom floor where they would keep the animals. This is a really, really grotesque, if you will, place to birth a baby, let alone the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. At 14 years old, confused, scared, a husband that's decided to stand by her, even though society and culture and even religion said you should bring her out to town square and stone her because she is carrying an illegitimate child. Now, we can pretty up and put a halo on it and have the nativity scene and all stand around and sing, you know, what child is this or whatever and feel really great about it all. But the reality is, is that divine things are birthed out of messes, which means if you and me are a little bit of a mess, divine things can be birthed from the mess. And I'll say this, the most divine ideas or things are only birthed from messes. We can make the Bible and the scripture try to strip some of the graphic nature out of it. I could feel the uncomfortability in the room as she read that, and yet none of us can deny that is the process of birth and raising a child. Why are we uncomfortable with it? Because we start to mix, um, you got to hear this now. The minute we start to actually mix in the humanity of the mess of humanity along with the, the idea of the divine, we get really nervous. Those things don't belong together. She said cracked what? It immediately makes many of us uncomfortable, probably more men than women, but, but it makes us uncomfortable. Why? Because don't, don't mess up my pretty nativity scene. Don't mess up. This is the Christmas. Why are you messing with this? Let me tell you why. Because if, if what we project as Christians is the truth, then there's no room for any of us because we all have our messes. Right? I know some of you. And I know what Christmas dinner is going to look like. Half of you are going to be doing shots in the back room. Oh, no, we're not. Yes, you are. Some of you are going to get pre-gamed before you get to the Christmas gathering because your people are nuts. Right? I don't do that. Well, what did the doctor prescribe you that you're going to take before? Right? Mm-hmm. I'm only going to take a half. Okay, but you're just trying to get through it somehow or another. Let's be real. All right? Because such and such is going to be there, and you just know he's going to say something. And you just want to control it. Right? We have messes all around us. It's not clean and neat and pretty. And then we move ourselves to the life of Jesus. And Jesus embraces the human experience time and time again over his own informed study. Now, it says he was a carpenter. But we also understand that somewhere along the line, he got rabbinical training. He was teaching in the temple at 12. He knew the Torah. He knew the scriptures. He, he knew the tradition. When the Pharisees would say, but hey, wait a second, it says here, he knew exactly where they were talking about and what they were talking about, and he knew exactly how to speak towards it in a way that diverted them away from their tradition to embracing the humanity in front of them. You think that stopped today? I think we need it more than ever. Think about the woman at the well. Jesus comes back to the disciples. What do the disciples say? Why are you talking to that woman? Why? Jesus is like, because that human experience, the person in need, is more important than fitting in to who you think I should and shouldn't be talking to. Again, there's so many of them, I wrote down a couple. The woman caught in adultery. Same thing, the Pharisees standing there. How dare you stand on the side with her? He says, yeah, it's the truth. Which of, you, which of you who has not sinned, go ahead and pick up the first stone. Throw the first stone. They all walked away. Think about this. Healing on the Sabbath. The Pharisees say, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Jesus, Jesus says, because the human being in front of me needs healing. I don't care about your stupid Sabbath. <laughs> then he would disobey purity laws by having contact with lepers and with people with disabilities. Why are you, why are you even allowing that leper to be on the same side of the road as you? He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. 
How, 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 dare, how, dare we, you, how dare you violate our purity laws? All along, do you understand this, church? I need you to hear this part. I may not be doing a good job articulating it, but I need you to hear this part. All along, he's paving the way for you and I to both have our mess of humanity all around us and yet still do divine things. Do you see that? Every one of these is another opportunity for you and I to go, wait a second, this doesn't fit into my theology, and yet it feels like the right thing to do. Is there any, is there any, uh, you know, can we find this in the word of God? I don't know if we can find the opposite. It, it feels almost like every time Jesus is moved to do something for another human being, he's breaking some sort of law and order. Come on. Where do we find this in the tradition of Jesus? Are you kidding me? The man was killed. Partially, one of the, one of the reasons was because he defied both the government and the religious tradition of the day when it came to actually doing something on behalf of humanity. He was murdered because he was placing more value on humanity than he was on some written law. I mean, as a church, why do we let this person or that person or this person, it's fine, they can come to church. Why, can't, why do you let them be a part of this and that? And they're, now you've got them ministering and playing this or doing this or whatever, blah, 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 blah. You know, all this. Where do you find that in the word of God? Tell me where you find the opposite. I can't not find it in the word of God. Come on. I, I, think about this. And I'm not going to be much longer today, but... Um, I already said that, I already said that. Wow, my memory is good. Okay. We, the opposite is true. We don't need to deny our human experience in order to embrace divine order or ideas. We don't have to say to that phone call, well, that's because they're in sin and that's why they're taking their own life. We don't have to be so callous to humanity, so, so hateful even to humanity in order to embrace divine ideas. If a divine concept or idea or understanding that we have causes us to be so callous towards human life and human suffering, it is not divine. I don't care. Give me chapter and verse all you want. It's not divine. What does all of the law and the prophets hang on? Come on. Loving God and loving one another. If, if we don't do, in other words, if, 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 if a divine idea or concept or scripture or, or, you know, theological, you know, precept doesn't lead us to loving and embracing humanity and honoring and respecting the human experience, it isn't divine. Then it falls to the floor. It hangs on nothing. Oh, you're preaching so good today, Dan. I'm so proud about you, right? The two are designed to work in tandem. They are not opposing each other. We don't have a human experience that then is rejecting a divine idea. We have a human experience that is informing a divine idea and vice versa. Divine things are not rejecting human experiences Divine ideas or concepts or, 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 or spiritual precepts should be informing the human experience. It works both ways. I read something in the word of God and I realize, hey, this might be an unhealthy pattern in my life. So I shift my own human experience to align with something that I believe in, is informing it. But if that is true, which basically 100 out of 100 Christians believe that if we read the Bible, we should do what it says. Everybody agrees with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But if we believe in that, we have to believe the opposite is true, which is when a human experience, come on, that seems like the right thing and the right that, that, that a loving father would do towards a child isn't, we don't find permission for it in the scriptures, then the human experience should have just as much value to ask us to go back to that precept or idea and say, am I missing something or is this taken out of context or is the cultural part of this um, you know, are we, are we getting it wrong? All right, 
so let's make it plainer. Um, you have an encounter with somebody, and it just simply, I, I, I have this happen to me on a regular basis where I remember, I remember a sermon, a line, a scripture that pops into my head in a moment, and every fiber of my being is saying in that moment, um, ignore what you're feeling and seeing right now with the person in front of you. Don't get caught up in it. Don't get caught up in the emotion. Don't get caught up in what they're telling you. Don't get caught up in it because, you know, you know this is not right. We have this every day of our lives. And it feels like we're doing something so holy by abstaining from entering into our hearts beginning to be compassionate and wanting to do something that we, our heart is screaming at us is the right thing to do, but our head is telling us, don't you dare you have chapter and verse and an excuse not to do this. And it happens. And the reason is because we spent a lot of time in the church denigrating and devaluing the human experience. We spent a lot of time. How do you know this? I've been a part of it. We didn't know we were doing it. It's what we were taught. We told people, Feelings lie to you. Your emotions, don't be guided by your emotions. You can't trust yourself, right? Don't be a victim. And we've raised a generation of people who can't speak up for themselves, especially, especially, gentlemen, I hate to say this, I don't, but for you, that makes you feel better. Uh, especially the women in the evangelical world. And, and other marginalized groups. We, they, they've lost their voice. They've been told that they're inferior, told that they have a role, and that role is so important, but the role always seems like it is very clear that it is on a lower level. We have time and time again told people just the most godly thing you can do is just keep going. Don't complain. Imagine. Imagine Joseph saying to his 14-year-old bride, in the middle of what she just read, saying, hey, don't complain. God chose you to birth Jesus. I don't want to hear how much pain you're in. We'd slap him across the face. Right? But yet we do it all the time in just different language in the church. How many times have we seen a woman abused by a man, you know, over the years it doesn't happen quite as much anymore in the church because we're hopefully waking up a little bit, but how many times have we seen in church situations where we would we'd laud and applaud a woman for sticking by her man, even though he slapped her around every Friday night when he had too much to drink? We said, that's spiritual. Speaking up and saying, that is enough. My human experience and this body of mine is worth defending. And saying enough is enough. Somehow we made that like evil, weak, not loyal, not faithful. We've done it in subtle ways and sometimes not so subtle ways. But the reality is this. You cannot read the life of Jesus or Mary or Joseph or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and not understand the Bible is making it very clear that the human experience of pain and suffering and betrayal and rejection and all the things I listed earlier are, are just as valuable as taking into consideration as any law that's written in the scriptures. Come on, church, you got to hear this so I can end. 
you got to hear this. And, and when we think about this story, and then we take a step back into our own lives where we all have these little messes here and there, and some of them are big messes, and we think that there's nothing spiritual or divine that can come out of that. We just weather the storm and get through it and try to get everything back to its neat, pretty order so that we can look and appear like everything is going good and God's blessing us and favoring and the Lord's with me and all that kind of stuff. Understand this, nothing comes out of faking it. There's nothing spiritual about faking it. I don't care if you say God or the Holy Spirit. You got to have the S a little extra long. I don't care how you do it. If you're faking it and not allowing your, your humanity and the humanity of those around you to also have influence and inform your ability or your capacity to understand who God is, which is your theology, then we aren't going to get anywhere because divine ideas are birthed from messes. Come on, the graphic nature of his death, burial, and resurrection where it says that blood and water flowed from his side or the poison from the thorns that went into his head. The Bible says he began to literally begin to be feverish from it. Why are we describing the, the, all the way down to the diagnosis of what's going on with Jesus on the cross, that he, he's been beginning to convulse, that he's trying to get his last breath, that he's losing consciousness? Why, do we, why are we hearing about the pain and the suffering and the torture and the torment? Why can't we just say he died for all of our sins? Why do we have to hear about the gory details? Because all of us live in the gory details. And somehow it resurrects the hope inside of us that even in the midst of the mess, God can do something divine. Come on, you can stand to your feet with me. If your life is not a mess, hang out with some of these people here. They will get you in a mess, all right? Say, so I have no idea what you're talking about. Does this make sense, church? Let's pray and go have some grilled cheese and tomato soup and have a good week. And we'll see you here on Saturday, of course, 6 p.m. Unless you're out of town, you've got something going on that night, but we'd love to have you otherwise. Thank you, Jim. Father, we just thank you today as we bow our heads. We, we, we think through the details of the birth of Jesus or the death, burial, and resurrection, or even the life that he lived. We understand that there's a lot, there's decades of history for some of us that are pushing us in the direction of devaluing the human experience and prioritizing what we've been taught over what we're seeing right in front of us. We realize that there's, for some of us, there's the residue of that is, is really strong. It's hard to just get rid of. But we realize on this journey together, Father, we realize together on this journey that we, we are not diminishing spirituality when we allow the practical human experience of our life to move us. We're actually being faithful. Thank you for that today, Father. I needed the reminder.
myself. We just ask for your blessings to continue to rain down on us. Your favor, your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone says, amen. We'll see you soon. God bless you guys. Please join us if you can for Food Truck Sunday outside. We'll see you out there.